So if you could be here around nine, that would be great. Okay. Well, listen here. Hello, and welcome to 90 Day Fiance MK. I'm Mr. O, and today, Ms. H and I will be discussing Season 5, Episode 8 of Happily Ever After, and Season 2, Episode 10 of The Other Way. On Happily Ever After, Paul buys some dog food and gets told to grow up again, Angela hears about her test results, Kalani and Asuelu hit the road, Tanya and Sinjin go to South Africa, Debbie sabotages Colt, Eric drives both of us up a wall, and Andre asks Charlie to take it outside. On the other way, Jihoon makes an emergency run to the ATM, Jenny and Samit start to try to win over the family, Melissa's mom tells Tim exactly what she thinks, and Biniam and his flexible dance partner show us their moves. As always, we'll have our students of the week, class dances, and life lessons. We'll also spend some time talking about some of the very serious things that came up on social media for one of these couples this weekend. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, leave us a five-star rating review. If you like, if you watch Love After Lockup, please listen to our other podcast, Love After Lockup MK, wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, thanks for listening. Stay safe and enjoy. Hello, Mr. O. Hello, Miss H. How are you? I am getting along. There's actually a tropical storm coming through tomorrow, so, you know. Yep. So what better way to spend your time than to do this podcast right now, right? That's right. And I will listen to it tomorrow. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Right. (laughs) And especially because it's a little late than we're used to. There's been a lot of things going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, there have been a lot of things going on. We're just trying to catch up. Right, right. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to start off with uh, Paul and Karini, just because there seems to be a lot of in real life drama with them at the moment. So we kind of just want to talk about what's going on with them, and we'll kind of kick off the show uh, talking about them. So in real life, and just to kind of briefly summarize from our understanding and, you know, Mr. O, if I'm wrong about anything, feel free to interrupt. Sure. But Paul kind of came out a few days ago airing a lot of dirty laundry, which for the most part isn't unlike Paul. I mean, we've done a few reality or sorry, rumor roundups where Paul has done similar things. And about a week later, you know, they're back together again, question mark, seemingly so. Yeah, they're using it like events, smiling together and things like that. Right, right. Just yeah. like out of nowhere, no explanation, just right. okay. Just, okay, I guess they're back together again. So this time around, Paul uh, vented some pretty serious allegations and situations there. So he's alleging that Karini has cheated on him. So then he was trying to post that he had been at the ER getting an STD test and you know the people on Reddit asked some very valid questions. Why are you going to the ER in the time (laughs) of a pandemic (laughs) to get an STD test? (laughs) Yeah that is not exactly the thing you like rush to the ER to get like you just you can go to a minute clinic for that like if you really want it done. Yeah it just doesn't seem like a good allocation of resources here. (laughs) So he posted that, um, is claiming that Karini is then she's disappeared. She's trying to hide out with her child, maybe trying to escape the country, possibly. Um, And then he seems to think it will help his cause. I'm not really sure why. Paul has a very strange train of thought to post the police report of a statement Karini had given that basically accused Paul of marital rape, uh, verbal physical abuse, and just a lot of just really disgusting things. Which, once again, the source of this is Paul. (laughs) Yes. Uh, I think he was trying to, I think... He was like, look at what the, someone's made her do. She's making these crazy false allegations. And nobody took it that way but him. Everybody else really was like, oh, no, I believe Karini. Yeah. Because it also came at the same time with a restraining order, which sure. was issued, which means that there's some, you know, at least the court or whatever believes that there's validity to what she's saying. Right. Yeah. So then 
Paul was, I don't know, I almost thought it was his way of kind of crowdsourcing a where is Carini search. You know, somehow his fans would, you know, let him know where she was. So she actually came out on her Instagram just last night uh, pretty much saying that she's fine. She's okay. She's been in contact with a lawyer. So don't worry. She's not doing anything illegal. If there's a GoFundMe, it's probably a scam. It's not coming from her. And, you know, just she made some kind of generic statement about, you know, sometimes relationships don't work out. You just kind of have to move on. So very much without saying that things aren't going well in her world, implying that things are not going well in their relationship. So we don't really know. And then, Mr. O, you said something about. Yeah. And then earlier today. Like, before mm -hmm. we recorded at some point, Paul, like, posted, and I think he took it back down, mm -hmm. just just posted on his Instagram, like, without comment or anything, just a flight itinerary, a one-way ticket flight itinerary to go to Manaus in, like, three weeks. And that's supposedly after his court date, right? Whatever hearing they would have regarding the restraining order or something. So it was something. Like, yeah. I'm not 100% sure what was going on with that. It was like, what? It was very, very, yeah, I want to say Once unusual. Once again, but... the source of this is from Paul. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like, well, it's got to be true because this doesn't make him look good. But it's really hard to say what his motivation is for posting all of this. Right. Except to say, like, I'm coming to get you. You can't ever <laughs> escape me. I honestly I can't figure out. I cannot map out what he's thinking. Um and, you know, we just hope everything ends to the best. If the accusations are true, you know, fuck Paul and I hope Karina gets safe. Like, that's, Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, to be honest, like, we think this show is supposed to be fun, right? But right. then when things like this happen, it takes it to a really dark place. And it's just like, ooh. So Mr. Ner oh and I had actually discussed whether or not we should continue covering Paul and Karini. And what we had kind of decided on was that, you know, Creeny does benefit from the show right now. And this is something that, uh, you know, has happened, I'm assuming, post-production. Yeah. We're still unsure what kind of the truth is at this point. So this isn't incredibly exact to Jeffrey, who we had previously not covered. So we had kind of come to the conclusion that we'll continue covering Paul and Carini for this season. But if Paul were to be on the show after this, we would not cover him again. And we were talking about, you know, we doubt we'll see Carini after this season. She barely shows any interest on being on the show this season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about, like, she didn't even worry about making herself up. She's in, basically, it seems like the bare minimum of, of scenes they will, she will be in. She's right. not in this episode. You know, she was only in one out of two scenes last episode. She doesn't even try to hide her contempt for Paul at all in this season. Right. You know, so it's like, I don't think she's super motivated to be on another season. She, it just seems like she's really disinterested. Mm-hmm. So speaking of a lack of Karini, let's go ahead and jump into the recap for this episode. So Paul meets up with his mom, Mary, to ask her advice. But really, that's just Paul speak for tricking her into paying for pet supplies. Mary sees right through him and asks him if he only asked to meet up to get her to pay for the dog food. Paul admits, oh, well, yeah. And Mary warns she talked to him about all of this, although she does inevitably foot the bill. Mary thinks the situation is pretty dire. Since he can't pay to feed his pets, how is he going to pay to feed his family? Mary asks how the job hunt is going, and Paul says that he's struggling to find something since he has a criminal record of arson from, he says, about 10 years ago, but it's actually less than that. Mary questions why they left Brazil if Paul had no plan for making money. She asks what Creeny thinks about the situation, and Paul tells us she's sad and lonely. He implies that she has postpartum depression. Mary then throws in some tough love and calls him a deadbeat, and she wouldn't want to be with him. She also tells him that this isn't fair to bring a baby into this situation, and he needs to do right by his family. Paul ends their outing by asking if Mary thinks he's getting too fat, 
Finn maybe needs to go to the gym. And Mary yells at him and tells him that his weight is the least of his worries right now and to just get a job already. Paul says, yeah, 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 okay. I'll figure it out. You know me. But it's like, we know you, we, Paul, yeah, and this is problem. why we have to get on you for <laughs> <Yeah>. getting a job. <laughs> okay, so we don't know the whole story, but uh, what do you think has happened since since this show in real time? Mm. I mean, you mean between what happened here? Yes, and where we are currently. Where in our... we are currently? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I just think Paul's a Paul's not a good dude. No. Like, I, he's just, he, he, I mean, this is not his first run in. With the law and with restraining orders. Yes, right? and blatantly, like, violating the restraining orders. But then, like, oh, like, he always tries to get people on his side, mm -hmm. right? Trying to get them to see the way he sees it. Like, he texted his uh, ex who had a restraining order against him. And he said, oh, but I had to ask her about this. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's not how a restraining order works. It doesn't mean because you feel it's justified you're allowed to contact them. It means you're not allowed to contact them no matter what. Right. Right. Because uh, cause that's one of the things that people who need restraining orders do. They will always find some kind of excuse to mm -hmm. talk to you. Oh, did you... Uh, did I leave my stuff at your house? Like, no, you know you didn't leave <laughs> yeah. your stuff at my house. Like, you you know this. You're just trying to get me, get in. Because yeah. I mean, it, it the way the way he describes how Karini is feeling. I mean, yes, he could say postpartum depression if he wants, but it matches an abuse victim. Like, yeah, I definitely feel like he's setting her up, and if anything. Not even setting her up for, like, malicious ways, but almost trying to come up with a reason why Karini hates him right now. I mean, we've heard her say at least twice this season that she hates him. Yeah, you're a terrible husband, I, we've, we've heard, yeah. In a very offhand, like, I hate you, Paul. You know, just kind of like a not in a very, like, aggressive, they're in an argument, but just kind of like one of those, like, flippant things to say. And so it's kind of like, I feel like he's trying to justify her feeling that way by going, oh, no, it's not me. It's the postpartum. She just feels bad about herself. He doesn't even really seem to take ownership of the arson that he was guilty of, that he is the reason he can't get a yeah. job. He explains that away. Like, oh, that, it wasn't really arson. Like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it was just the Dover situation. You guys would understand better if you knew what, if you knew the facts. It's like, well, right. well. I do know the facts, and the facts are you were convicted of arson. Like, <laughs> Okay, so I know you say that Paul is a bad dude, and it's not that I disagree with you, but can you imagine him in prison? No, 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 no. He, he Just like most, you know, abusers, he's only going to do it to the people he knows he can get away with it, right? It's a definitely power imbalance thing. Sure, but I mean, he's actually been to prison, and it's just oh, like, that's I true. don't... I don't understand how he survived because he doesn't seem like he would be tough enough to roll with that crowd. No, and he does seem like he would be weird enough to piss off everybody in prison. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So that is an interesting thing. I wonder what kind of – I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, I wonder what his prison experience was like. I thankfully don't know much about prison besides, you know – Love after lockup. Yeah. So, and which is outside of prison. Yeah. Right. You see the people that come out of love after lockup, which by the way, we have a podcast. You should check it out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just one of those things where you're like, uh, those people seemed like, I don't want to say hardened criminals, but like, but they, they, they you're right. They do, do okay. seem, they do seem to have, if they didn't have it before, an they edge to them develop, or something. Yeah. I was going to say like a hardened exterior. Like right. to, to deal with it. Yeah. Like not this goofy, like duck waddling, like right. scared of everything, body condom wearing, like paranoid weirdo. Right. And that's why I feel like it, I feel like it's a hard thing to kind of wrap around because I don't think we've seen the Paul that went to prison. I think he's no. he is decently good at keeping that off the camera. That's right? scary to me. Yeah. It is scary. It's very scary. And that's what's yeah. scary about this kind of situation is like somebody who, you know, can get people on their side and can get mm -hmm. people to, can, to to believe they're part of the story and then, you know, turn into a completely different person in another situation. Very scary. Yeah. 
It's actually kind of funny that we, for the most part, don't think Paul's a great person. I mean, like, having nothing to do with, like, some of the really illegal bad things he's done. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, just, you know, let's forget about that. Like, he's just a terrible husband. Yeah, not a good husband. Not a good dad. Yeah, he's just terrible. So it's kind of funny that we gave him Student of the Week last week. And it's really, like, our basis of that was, like, well, he's improved. And it's, like, now we have this week and it's just like okay yeah. no. take it back take it back yep. yeah absolutely take it back all right moving on to moving on to more fun things um tanya and sinjin okay are on their way to south africa they're driving in a car to a new york city adjacent hotel so they can catch their early morning flight from jfk tanya tells us her concerns for the trip namely that sinjin will spend the whole time drunk with his friends she also tells this to sinjin in the car on the way to new york which leads to a bickering argument where Sinjin brings up her drinking and basically anything else he can think of to kind of strike back. They wake up the next morning both feeling pretty bad about the fight they had, which, of course, Tanya prefers to prefers to refer to as heated discussions. God. But Sinjin is really excited to get on the plane. Tanya tells him not to rush because they have plenty of time to make their flight. And actually, she still has to finish her tea. Then she tries to drink the entire mug of hot tea while he stands there. She's standing in the middle of the room drinking this mug of tea. He's standing by the luggage watching her drink the tea as they both stand there. And it's hot, so she can't drink it fast. It was just an incredibly awkward moment. It was really weird. Like, what was that thing she kept on going, ah, ah. I think it's because she was trying to drink the ah. hot tea too fast. And it was, like, hot, so she's like, ah. Or if she was just being trolling him. I couldn't tell which one it was. It was weird. No one does that. So weird. It Except was so if weird. you're on a Pepsi commercial or something. <laughs> but eventually they do make it to the flight and Sinjin immediately loses his shoes, which is apparently South Africa style for him. God. They bicker again about the difference between being laid back and not enforcing laws because that <laughs> made a difference for some reason. When they finally get to Cape Town, Sinjin is practically sprinting through the airport to get to his family, but keeps leaving Tanya back in the dust because, you know, she has a boot still. When they finally get out, everyone is excited to see Sinjin's mom and his teenage sister, who even made a sign for him. Sinjin tells us, to Tanya's dismay, how excited he is to be back in South Africa. Then Sinjin's mom tells us that she wants to find out how happy he actually is in America. That's kind of her goal for the trip. Now, later, Sinjin and his family are out getting groceries while Tanya is sleeping off the flight. And that's when his mom decides to ask him how things are really going. The story he tells is not great. He makes it sound like he's cold, fights all the time, and Tanya is way less carefree than advertised. The mom really wonders if he can ever be happy in the States. So, okay, there was a lot of camera time for these two, but not Mm -hmm. a whole lot of new information. Right, they came out. No. So, if you had to be in that weird situation, would you rather be the person who has to sit there drinking their tea really fast? And I'm pretty sure she said it was tea and not coffee. Or the person who has to sit there and watch as someone else drinks their tea really fast. It depends on how they drink it. If they drink it like Tanya, it was like making (laughs) me feel uncomfortable. Like the way she was like, ah. Ah, she kept making like, big eyes oh, at him, like, mm, drinking the tea. It was that would so drive weird. me insane. So if that were the case, I'd rather be drinking the piping hot tea and just, like, <laughs> having someone wait for me. Because I would not make them feel uncomfortable make, by making weird sounds like that. I feel like if she would have sat down and drank the tea and be like, listen, I'm going to drink my tea. Not like, I'm going to drink my tea with my hand on my suitcase. Just let's go, like, trying to chug it. I don't. But then not go, trying to chug it and kind of taking her time. It was a weird both things well they she were was in doing. a hotel too right most hotels have the little to-go cups it's true they do because you usually get like the little single serve like keurig thing yeah. that they put in the hotel room with the with the with the to-go cups yeah because and i feel like hotels are doing that more and more because i never thought about this before but i had heard someone tell me that they had watched something on the news about how they clean the glasses in a hotel room And it's basically Uh using a dish rag. And I was like, I never really thought about that before, but it would probably be a lot easier for someone to do that rather than to gather up all the glasses 
and move them to another location to wash them properly, right? That's true. Because I, you're right, because I had just kind of assumed they use like that steam, same like steam thing they have at a bar. You know, right. but they put it all, all the glasses in and then steam them and then pop them back open. Yeah, but they would have to take it out of every hotel room, right? And that's a lot if you're kind of thinking about, like, these larger hotels. And so it, like, never occurred to me. And then that super grossed me out. And so now I very much avoid glasses in a hotel room. But I find that more and more hotels, you get, like, kind of, like, plastic or the styrofoam, like, that coffee are like, cups And they're, like, something. wrapped. Individually wrapped. Individually yes. wrapped, yeah. Yeah. So I trust that a little bit more, but even still, right. like like I said, I'm a little wary of those kind know. of things. But bottom line, there's probably a to-go cup. There is almost certainly a to-go cup. That is true. And, I mean, they're going in, immediately to the airport. There's coffee and tea in the airport, too. Like, yeah. I mean, because, I don't know. I tend to get – I tend to I tend to do that. I tend to get, you know, through security to get my tea, my coffee. Because the hotel coffee is nasty. Like, at least I can get a Starbucks in the oh. in the airport. Well, I'm not a coffee drinker, so you know that's yes. very low priority <laughs> to me. I know I'm, I'm like, the only one, I feel like. Right? Especially in, yeah, teaching. Yeah. And, yeah, that's... yeah. Especially as an adult, we'll say right, that. Right, right. <laughs> okay, so the other thing that really bothered me about Tanya, I feel like this was, we've been kind of having recently... Sinjin looking worse and worse and worse. And then they were yeah. finally, like, throwing us a bone and be like, nah, remember Tanya's the worst. Because the other thing is her being, like, weirdly concerned that he was too excited to be home. Mm -hmm. Like, that just seemed mean. <laughs> like, uh. Yeah, I mean, it's very self-centered. I think the reason why was because, and, okay, how many other couples have we seen this exact same concern? They're scared that they won't want to come back. Mm -hmm. That's true. You know? So I feel like that's part of it. I think also part of it is... You know, Sinjin seems a bit skittish when it comes to the whole commitment thing. And maybe partying with his friends will remind him, oh, yeah, this is not the life I want. I want to party with my friends. Oh, party with my friends. Yeah. I don't yeah. like this cold. Yeah. I feel like that she could solve a lot of these problems by, like, just moving, moving to, south. Yeah, by just moving <laughs> south. Right. Right. I mean, we'll see if for her foot is better. Wasn't that the barrier that they was said the, before? That's what they said it was. And then the insurance didn't transfer to other states or something. And so they had to right. stay in Connecticut. But yeah. yeah, I just feel like if if he could be warmer, <laughs> he would be so much happier. Right. <laughs> but speaking of health care, what's wrong with his wrist? I don't know. They never mentioned it. He was wearing that wrist brace when he met up with his mom and his sister in mm -hmm. the park. And it, it, I mean, it was, okay, may, you're giving me that look like you didn't notice. It. No, I noticed. Oh, no, I totally noticed the wrist brace. Okay. Yes, I totally noticed. I was the gonna wrist say, brace. how did you miss it? It was like a big black wrap on his arm. <laughs> but yeah, um, but what happened to his wrist? So I was like, mm, more yeah. health issues. I mean, yeah, it, it's it's a lot of times. At least my experience of people as I've known, sometimes when they do surgeries and they need a piece of bone, they take it from your wrist. Mm -hmm. Right. And then when you heal, they tell you to put that wrist brace on because it just it covers it up and it, you don't have to worry about the um, bandages coming loose and stuff. So it could have been a surgery thing. But wait, I don't why know. is Sinjin getting surgery? I don't know. I don't know. So it'd be something small. Oh, well, uh, my first thought was carpal tunnel. But let's be real here. Sinjin doesn't know how to use a computer. Yeah. yeah <laughs> not Dang, hang on. That didn't, that didn't. I mean, he could have fallen or something. I don't know. Maybe he was. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think he was in the car with Tanya, was he? If he was, it wouldn't be. It would. His injury wouldn't. If it was yeah. major, it was so major. He was still wearing a brace for it. Then, like, I feel like they would have mentioned that. Also, because I was gonna say he's been lifting her, carrying her around this whole time. That can't right. be good for her either. Yeah. I mean, for him, in his wrist. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to let's. Uh, cover Libby and Andre. So it's the morning after their first family dinner and Andre is eating some gelatinous leftovers, which Libby just turns her no nose up at. Andre asks Libby if she was drunk last night because that is the only logical explanation of why Libby threw Andre under the bus and claimed she didn't want to have their second wedding. Andre is confident she won't actually cancel it because it would be last minute and she wouldn't want to disappoint him like that. 
Libby is tired of being caught in the middle and is tired of the fighting and the bickering. Andre says that her family shouldn't have even come in the first place and he continues to confront her about her lack of support of him being a stay-at-home dad. He asks why she didn't defend him to her dad, Chuck, since she has been previously okay with Andre taking care of their daughter, Ellie. Libby says Andre just plays video games all day and he's gotten too comfortable not working and she's getting, uh, Libby, I mean, sorry, uh, Ellie is getting old enough to have family help out more. Andre suspects her change of heart is really just Libby being influenced by her family's opinion. Libby says she was asked her opinion and she's not going to just, like, lie to them. Andre says that he is the best man for the job in taking care of Ellie, and Libby asks him if he's happy with that arrangement, and Andre says it is what it is. He says they're doing fine financially, so what's the problem? Libby then gets on Andre's case for starting shit with Charlie and Chuck, and Andre says the reason they fought was because Charlie kept asking personal questions about their relationship, and Libby defends Charlie, saying, well, what else is he going to talk to you about? Libby thinks that Andre needs to do more to prove himself to her family. That night, they go to dinner with Andre's friends and Libby's family at a hunting lodge decorated restaurant where they sit down to a traditional meal. Charlie and Chuck try the food and both think that the food is really weird. Chuck shares his observation on child rearing in Moldova versus America. Chuck and Charlie meet Alex, who lived uh, in Ireland with Andre, and Alex evaded some Ireland questions, saying it wasn't his place to answer, so Chuck and Charlie then start asking the table and Andre directly what the deal was. Their theory was that he moved to Ireland with the intention of finding a way to America, and Libby was his ticket to a green card, which annoys and angers Andre. Andre asks Libby to intervene and get her family to shut up, and Charlie says that he's just trying to get to know him, but Andre says his questions are offensive, and Libby then says that Andre gets defensive. Charlie continues in on Andre, and Libby is physically in the middle of Andre and Charlie. Then they both stand up with the intention of getting physical with one another. So this is just, oh God. It's like the same th argument. Uh -huh. being played out just in a slightly different way with a slightly separate cast of characters on Andre's side who just happen to be bystanders this season. But are you Team Andre or Team Charlie? Oh, Andre. I, I, not even close. Charlie's and an I asshole. And I don't even understand why Libby is sitting there defending her brother this entire time. No, he's not even... Okay, because I feel like... There's a whole bunch into it, but even once you get to the point where he's like, listen, I don't want to talk about this. This is my right. friggin' basically my rehearsal dinner for my wedding. Stop asking me about why you got why you think I got fired from a job. I'm done. And he's like, well, I'm just asking questions. Maybe you yeah. should know. And like and, and I even rehearsed the name because guess what? I oh, just got a question. We got a novice guy. They've already been married for like two years. Right. There's no, we're past the, I'm just asking questions. I need to get the novice guy. That's yeah. done. That ship has yeah, sailed. Yeah, you could have done that not in Moldova. <laughs> yeah. During a celebration that they, quite frankly, didn't even really want you at. Well, I shouldn't say they. Andre didn't even really want you for at. For specifically this reason. Like, right. Yeah. Oh, right. God. And I, I'm going to point this I, I point this out, too, because this is something I didn't know. I learned from Reddit. Charlie's they're all worried about his past, blah, blah, blah. Charlie's been arrested twice. He has two, <laughs> two DUIs. This is not a like oh. angel guy who's like, I'm just looking out to make murder my sister isn't with the criminal. Yeah. I don't like yeah. Charlie. I don't like no. him. No. No, I don't either. And I kind of wonder a little bit if he's doing Chuck's dirty work a little bit, because I feel like this is usually Chuck's role. Right. In all of this, right? Father Libby. And he kind of remained mostly quiet through this. And he chimed in every once in a while and be like, yeah, yeah, what is the answer to that, you know? But right. he wasn't the one kind of instigating this argument and letting it escalate to the fact where they're going to take it outside. Yeah, I I mean, I'm, I'm, my money's on Andre outside, by the way. No, right? <laughs> Did you see Charlie trying to throw punches? His arm oh, was, like, God. bent and, like, floppy. It was like, what are you oh, going to do, Charlie? No. I know. I feel like Andre's been this trained to This guy was a police officer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Money's on Andre as well. But I also feel like Libby is just so, like, why is she not defending her husband at all? It's very concerning. At all, because, I mean, the thing about it is, hey, dad, this is not the place to have this conversation. Right. 
boom. That's all she should say. That. But no, she because she does as much as he's right. And I don't think she realizes how right he is when mm-hmm. he's like, no, your opinion changed because your dad said his opinion. And then that yeah. became your opinion. Like she's like, I'm, not, I'm just going to say if somebody asked me an opinion, I'm not going to say it. He's like, yeah, but up until that moment, you had a different opinion. And as yeah. soon as your dad said it, oh, your opinion flops and changes. Yeah, I agree. She just doesn't know how to stand up to her family. And so it's easier for her to just let Andre kind of do it on her behalf in a lot of ways. Yeah. And she plays them both. But then she says one thing to Andre and another thing to her family when she's alone with them. And she just tries – she tries to like tell both sides they're right. Like that's going to solve the problem. No. Right? Yeah. And let me get to the other thing that really bothered me about it. The stupid American arrogance of like, he was just trying to get to Ireland so we could get to America. You know what? I will tell you, everybody in Ireland, if they heard that, would laugh at your face. They would be like, why would we want to go to America? Right. Ireland is so much better than America. <laughs> like, if you bet any any Western European person is like, no, I don't want to go to America. Are you crazy? Right. No. Yeah, I think it's ridiculous when you do have these Americans who – think that America is the best country in the world. And to me, it's kind of like, you know, partners. There's someone for everyone. So that doesn't (laughs) mean that everybody is going to like America. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to hate America. And there's always going to be something that you kind of maybe don't agree with, but you learn to live with. Right. Right? It's like a relationship. You know, it's something for everyone. But that's not to say that everybody like america is everybody's soulmate right right it just just everybody from everywhere in the world because it doesn't even make any sense how is getting to ireland get you closer to coming to america i don't know it didn't make any sense at all it doesn't yeah ridiculous all right moving on so kalani and asuelu so Kalani and Swelu are visiting the Samoan store to get gifts for Swelu's mom and sister in lieu of the cash money they really don't have to give. God. Asuelu is basically just grabbing at everything in the store, like a $50 can of corned beef and some definitely not worth $40 t-shirts. Kalani tries to talk him down, but they still end up with a bunch of stuff. While they're checking out, Asuelu brings up again that he would still like to give them money. He suggests that maybe they give her, give his mom the $1,000 she asked for. Kalani is like, no, because we don't have that much and it seems like you're trying to buy your family's affection. Asuelu says that's how Samoan families get closer, by giving money. (laughs) Kalani asks where this money is going to come from, and Asuelu says his pocket, because he has a job. Kalani points out that it's it's like his entire monthly wages, so then where's the money for the bills and stuff going to come from? To which he says, don't worry, God will take care of it. God. (laughs) Kalani suggests that they maybe give $50? And Asuelu says that's a slap in the face. So then they settle on $100 because that it's obvious Kalani's not going to go any higher. Um, and then the clerk brings up their total for their gifts, which is almost $200 more. God. So in the next scene, they're packing up to go to Washington. And Kalani notes that the bulk of Asuelu's not-so-light packaging is gifts for his family. He shrugs it off, and we hear that Kalani's sister is taking a flight the next day because... Everybody knows that Asuelu will be no help when he gets there. On the drive to the airport, they have a weird non-sequitur conversation about using airplane bathrooms. Then they get to the airport and fly to Portland, which I suppose is the closest airport. Once there, they have to pack the kids into the rental car, which does not go smoothly. I am pretty sure those seats were not in correctly. But it's – and it's already pretty late and the kids and Kalani are sleepy and cranky. At first, um, she says that maybe they would stay – their plan was to go to meet Asuelu's family. Kalani says maybe we can't stay for very long. And then as it becomes clear how cranky the kids are, given that they're crying the whole trip, she says we're just going to have to skip it and go to the Airbnb. Everybody needs to go to bed. Um, Asuelu is super upset about this, but he does relent and just you know makes a sulky face when they get to the Airbnb. God. All right, so – I don't know. What's the right – I would say what's the right amount of money to give if you only (laughs) make – how – or at least I could say this. How does Asuelu think God is going to provide them money? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's – 
It's like, well, can't God provide your mom money? <laughs> you yeah. can't work like that. Can't, yeah, why, can't, why, why, why are we God's middleman? He's, God should just give her right. money. Um, can it be like kind of like a speaking of God, like a tithing? Like maybe it's like, you, you know, 10%, 20%. Right. You know, maybe it's a percentage of what you make because I think that's more realistic because like Kalani has pointed out, a thousand is a hundred percent of your income. So right. that is a problem, yeah. right? Because that leaves you nothing. And so I kind of feel like, you know, if he, I don't know how much his mom is kind of privy to this information, but if he told his mom, listen, mom, I only make a thousand a month. That's kind of not like, how are you going to eat? Right. I'll give you a thousand, but can then I borrow like 800? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause I, and I don't know if he doesn't want to say that to his mom cause he feels bad. Like, because he would rather, it's almost like, yeah, I would rather starve than tell my mom she can't have all, as much money as she asks for, which is yeah. like, cause, cause they always say you got to take care of your family. And I was like, yeah, I feel like when you're ranking your family in terms of who you got to take care of. Your kids are first and they use the whole thousand like then. So there's nothing left. Right. Because I was going to say the kids, they can't make money themselves. Your mom hypothetically could make money. Now, she might be retired and not in a place where she's making money. But, you know, it's like, I don't know. Do his sisters have kids? Maybe right. they can also help. Out. I don't know. Because we, we've talked about this issue before. This is a very strong cultural thing. Because mm -hmm. like that's I, that's something growing up, my parents have said to me a lot. They're like, "The biggest gift I will ever give you is Hi. my retirement." No, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, "the The greatest gift we are looking to give you is you never having to pay for anything for us." Like that's like our goal in life is to not have to have our kids support us at all ever. It is odd to me because the way he talks about – both of them talk about Samoa. It, they talk about it like they don't have luxury items there, mm -hmm. right? That they are happy and content with having like little, right? right? Which is fine. It's weird to me that coming from that culture that – and I don't know if it's a Suelu or everybody – but this idea that somehow money equals love, because he even said something along the lines where Kalani asked him, you're like, do you think that if you give them less, it means that you love them less? And he's like, yes, if I give them more money, it means I love them more. That's how they'll see it. And right. it's just like odd to me. It like, is very odd. It is very odd. You know, but those two things don't seem to go together. No, they don't. I mean, it's it, especially if it's like. You know, it's like the I don't know, bring up the Bible story, but it's like the lady with the with the you know the people gave the gifts, and Jesus was like she gave the most of all because she gave everything she had. But these rich guys mm -hmm. only gave a little bit, right? It's like almost like that, but it's like is but they don't care. He doesn't uh, Swaylu. Maybe it's just because Swaylu's kind of dumb because he's kind of <laughs> dumb. Yeah. Is yeah. he like doesn't understand percentages at all? He's just like no bigger number, better love, and it's like but. If like a millionaire, if Jeff Bezos gave his mother a thousand dollars, it'd be like, "What are you doing, Jeff? Come on!" What are you oh yeah, no, gives her two thousand because that's twice as much as a Swelu. Yeah, that like, means he loves her twice as much. It's like not really. Means, He's got a ton more money. Yeah, right. So like, I, I just I can't imagine that she was like, "No, I'd rather your kids be hungry. Give me the money because I need to know how much you love me." Like, I don't know. Well, Mom seemed pretty Which is demanding. weird too because we don't we know he doesn't have an extremely close relationship with his mom. Right? Because yeah. we didn't know she was in even in the United States until last week. Right, right. So I don't really get, like, what he's trying to do here. And then he's acting like a spoiled brat again. As always. Like, he doesn't get his way, so he's sulking and, like... And I kind of get that, you know, it kind of sounded like they had prepared some kind of dinner or something for right. them. So I get that. That, you know, as someone who hosts things... It's super disappointing when you go to all this trouble to entertain and then something like that, you know, the plans go awry. But at the same time, it's like, Asuelo, you have two children. You have Which, to know that things don't go according to plan when you have kids. And this, and this one, I feel like even if I was Kalani, I would kind of be okay if we were like, listen, we'll go to the Airbnb. We'll get the kids in bed. As soon as the kids yeah. are asleep, go ahead. Go. Yeah. 
that's so funny. I put that in my notes. I was like, can't he drop them off, put them in bed, and then him of go Of all over? the times you can, like, leave Kalani alone with the kids, when they're yep. dead asleep, right? go for it. Perfect yeah. time. Sure. Yeah. Oh, goodness. <sighs> that canned beef, I was curious about it, so I looked it up. Uh-huh. You could get that stuff at Costco. I don't understand why they're going to the trouble of hauling this stuff around, you know, and he could get it cheaper at Costco, too. So it made no sense to me. I guess I guess it was probably a decent, I mean, a decent standard price for corned beef. Like, I don't know about that specific brand of corned beef, but I feel like canned corned beef is canned corned beef. Like, right. It, it is. When I looked it up on Costco, I think for the same... Um, it didn't come in the gigantic can, but remember, right. Asuelu was like trying to get the little cans, and I yeah. forgot how much they said it was a piece. But I think on uh, Costco, the website, I think I saw it was like thirty, thirty-five dollars for like six cans or something. Yeah, I mean that's not too bad because I, I I was just imagining it being like the markup on, you know, when you go to like or at least my grocery a small store, small mom and pop place. Well, no, I was actually thinking about the international part, right? There's usually an international aisle, right? And they'll have, like, there's a small part of the international aisle that's, like, the British part. And oh, it's, like, sure. Heinz canned beans. And it's, like, why are the Heinz... It's just... This is dumb. Because <laughs> like, the Heinz canned beans cost more because I'm importing them from England, even though like the, every other isn't canned it, bean is right next to it. Yeah, I was going to say, and isn't Heinz, like, in America anyway? <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. But they don't like packages. It's... I'm, like, I always get confused. Well, I, I always get say, confused by the British part of the international aisle. that place was not, like, your regular grocery store. It no. was, like, a mom and pop place. It was almost like a 7-Eleven. Yeah, because it was weirdly empty. And it was like, I get that it's like Samoan merchandise, but I feel mm -hmm. like sometimes they imported some stuff. It's still at the, you know, at the Kroger down the street. Like, Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on to Michael and Angela. So Angela and Michael take a walk in Fosse Park where they come across caged monkeys. Well, so Angela thinks. There are several babies that are waiting to be fed. So Michael takes a tomato and holds it in his hand as the baby jumps on his arm and tries to pry it out of his hands while Angela screams and Michael looks away. The park attendant tries to get Angela to hold the food and she's a hard pass as they move on. Angela thinks that Michael has a right to know about her potential inability to carry a child, but it's much more self-serving as she has decided to tell him that day because she is going to need his emotional support since she is getting her biopsy results that day. Angela starts off the conversation by saying the one egg she had left is gone and she's had some abnormal bleeding and Michael looks confused and asks if she can still be pregnant and Angela says that her health is the most important thing at this time as she is kind of discreetly holding a lit cigarette. <laughs> Angela then straight out says that she is concerned that she may have cancer, and Michael shows a lot of concern because he knows it's deadly, but then asks, what does it all mean? Angela laughs and says it means she's sick and toting a baby is out of the question. Angela asks him if he will want to have a baby with someone else if she cannot have a baby herself. He says he'll have to think about it, which Angela immediately gets upset about. Uh, but Michael says that being a father is the most important thing to him. And if it's not an option, it'll be really hard on him. So not wanting to wait for an official rejection, Angela says, well, maybe that's my answer. Michael pumps the brakes and says to wait, you know, for the test results. And Angela thinks that this is some kind of love test and he can't commit to her if she can't have kids, then they should end this right now. He says he needs time to process, but Angela doubts his love for her because of his hesitation. Angela video chats with Dr. Pettigrew with Michael. She is definitely in on this whole TV play up the drama angle because she starts by going through every basic test ever, which we really don't care about. But we finally learn that, uh, you know, even though Angela is, for the most part, pretty healthy, uh, she finally gets her test results. And Angela then decides to just straight up light up another cigarette. She's not discreet about it this time. <laughs> so Dr. Pettigrew tells her that the biopsy came back negative and everything looks fine. But she insists that Angela stop smoking. She finishes the conversation by telling Angela that her age will make having a baby a huge stress on her body. She is putting herself and the baby at risk. Michael straight up asks if the doctor would recommend having a baby. And the doctor says that that's the decision that they will have to make as a couple. Angela is real about the situation and says that dying to please him and leaving her grandbabies doesn't seem like a 
Good choice. Michael repeats that he still needs time to process and decide, and Angela tells him his choices are to be with her and to be American or to stay in his country. All right, so what do you think is more important to Michael at this point? Going to America, which, by the way, let me also point out that Angela is not the only person he is allowed to marry from America. Just (laughs) wanted to point that out. Um, But what do you think is more important to Angela? Going to America or having kids? To Michael. Yes, to Michael. Uh, Hmm. I think it's having kids. Yeah, you think so? I do. And but and I think it does that. I don't even think it's the most important thing because it's the most important thing to him, but because it's the most important thing to his mom. Mm-hmm. Right? Like he really seems – it seems like his big impetus behind having kids is his mom will be upset if she doesn't have kids. Like that's what right. is expected. It's what's supposed to happen. And yeah, also his standing in society, things like that, right? Yeah. Um, If he doesn't have kids. So I think – that's more important. I, It's really hard to get a read on this whole it coming to America thing because like he had Angela try to talk to the expats to see yeah. if she could stay in Nigeria. So I don't – we said he wants to come to America and we kind of thought that was his play all along. But I just don't know. And I don't know if like the longer he talks to Angela and be, is in this relationship, he was like, oh, maybe if this is the America – if this is my idea of an American woman, then – Maybe America's not all it was cracked up to be. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And maybe he's seeing some of the things that his hero, Donald Trump, is doing. Oh, maybe. Well, I don't know where he's yeah. at. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Nigeria has lower COVID rates than the U.S., but yes. <laughs> Goodness. Um, I just, I feel like he has kind of convinced me that he has genuine love for Angela. Uh-huh. And I do I do think he thinks his life will be harder in a lot of ways being in America. But I don't know. Like, this whole baby thing, it's like, I don't understand why it wasn't obvious to you before that this was a very slim possibility. Yeah, so yeah, his whole attitude has been really weird around this baby. Like, mm-hmm. a bit like he keeps putting it on the back burner because he keeps doing, like, that dumb and dumber thing. Like, so you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah, and he's just like, all right, ignorance is bliss. Let's chug along. Yeah, because I I do think he legitimately likes being around Angela. Mm -hmm. Like, as unbelievable as that can be. Like, he does, but – and I don't know. I I was really on this episode. I was on Team Michael, right? I Mm -hmm. thought, say, when you get huge news like that and a huge change of status of what's possible in the future to be like, I need to think about this. Right, and she is not giving him the space to do that. One hundred percent reasonable. Because she, she would rather I would rather him think about it than just be like immediately like no, I love you, commit, and then regret it for a long time. I feel like that's what most people do. Yeah, they do. They absolutely yeah, do. Yeah, and then they regret it. And then they regret it because yeah. like, well, I have to prove my love to her. It's like now you have to actually think about what it is you want. Like it. Right. It is. It is important and. Yes. Does it hurt Angela? Sure does. Would it hurt Angela more if he just leaves her in three years because he resents everything she made him do? It Probably. Yeah. That might be a little worse. And I feel like putting a positive spin to it, it's like if he chooses her at the end of it, you can say that this wasn't an impulsive decision. This was something that was well thought out. Right. And he really does love her. And I don't see why it has to be this negative thing. You know, like, oh, because you didn't say yes immediately, it means you don't love me or you don't really love me. It's like if love means being impulsive and irrational, well, that's okay, not, maybe yeah. maybe that's love. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's not. You do, I mean, you don't, you don't want to be just someone's – you don't want to get married and be in a relationship, be in love with somebody because you were, you were the le- path of least resistance. Yeah. Like that's not – that's not what yeah. anybody – I hope that's not what anybody wants. Like you would rather someone actually come to the you know, like, mm. deep knowing realization that I love this person, would love to spend the rest of my life with them. And I would like nothing more, not just like, oh, well, I guess we're doing this yeah. now. <laughs> OK. Well, I thought about it. I mean, well, no, not – I didn't think about it. But, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't want to start over. So I said yes. Yeah. You seemed upset. You seemed like you would get upset if I didn't say yes. So just went with it. Yeah. Right. I didn't want to fight goodness not the best okay all right so speaking to people who did want to fight let's go to larissa (laughs) i'm gonna go two in a row because i got them both yep all right 
So, dramatic piano music plays as we pick up the scene where we left off from last week. Remember, Larissa has learned through Natalie that Eric has been widely talking shit about their sex life while they were broken up, and she is going to confront him about it. It doesn't go well and almost immediately turns into a shouting match. Larissa wants to know why he would tell people the things he said, because clearly if he did, he must truly hate her. Eric's position seems to be that they had an agreement God. that he had 100% immunity from anything he did when they were broken up. Larissa says that she was extra offended that she did this on the phone that she lent him or possibly gave him. That's actually a significant point. He tells her to watch her mouth because whose house is she staying in right now? At this point, Larissa becomes concerned that he might call the cops, which he knows will possibly end in her deportation. In separate interviews, each person believes they are owed an apology. Eric tells us, while wildly gesticulating with his hands, Ugh. every word he says... God, I hate him. ...that Larissa owes him an apology based on their agreement, and that she should think about not about the terrible things he's done, but why she got to back together with him, which I can only assume means desperation and loneliness. <laughs> right, that's what I was thinking. He says they agreed to talk things over like adults. They then switch back to the argument where he immediately tells Larissa that she looks like Dolly Parton hanging out in a robe. They argue in circles a little while longer, and then eventually Larissa calls Carmen to schedule a meetup later, and Eric leaves the house. When Larissa meets Carmen, they talk about, you know, Carmen doing the I told you so, and you can do better in th than this, which, I mean, is real talk, but also still. But then they're interrupted by a phone call from David, Eric's roommate. It turns out Eric can't call Larissa because Larissa took the phone that she says was just a loner. David tells her that now that she's let him keep it for so long, especially after a breakup, it could pretty much easily be seen as a gift rather than a loan, which means that when she took it, she could actually be construed as her stealing it. And oh. Eric is thinking about filing charges. Larissa becomes so enraged that she doesn't seem to have actually heard what David said. And just screams nonsense at him until they hang up. Soon there is a mysterious ringing at the doorbell, and they worry it might be the cops when the episode ends. All right, so you were texting me already, like nonstop through this I segment. I hate him. I so hate him I'm so just, much. So I like, I'm just gonna let you go and tell me, tell us about how much you hate Eric. That's Ugh. okay. Well, and I was bold enough to say to Mister O when I was texting him that I actually would say that I hate. Eric more than I hate Colt and more than I hate Tom which that's big if you have heard this podcast you know that's huge <laughs> in my book um let's just start off with why he's even here he's like a fame whore right and so I feel like all the things that he's kind of done and that's already setting him back in my book Right. Hugely, right? Because right. that is the one that's probably my biggest thing that I hate about Tom. Total fame whore. So once you're like just trying to be in the spotlight, just trying to do things for attention, already you're on my shit list. Okay. I feel like he made the agreement with her because he knew he did some pretty messed up shit that he just didn't even want to acknowledge or whatever right. about later. But he knows he did wrong. In, at some point when he was doing his interview, he says something like, oh, you know, I, I may have talked about our sex life, but, like, it was an accident. Like, that's the way he kind of yeah. posed it. I may have said something, but the bigger deal is, here is that she's, what would he say, unburying the dead or something like that is what he kept yes, saying? Yes, he kept on saying that. Like, it's part of the past... And like you said, like, I'm somehow exonerated from everything that has happened, and we should just move on. You did some pretty shitty things, right. and she is just finding out about that. Right. And it's like, you can't get, when, when someone says, let's forget about what happened while we were broken up, I assume they mean, like, you know, if I hooked up with somebody. Right. Or, they, they, like, this and that. Like, the relationshipy stuff that happened when we were broken up, that doesn't count as cheating or anything. We were broken up. We're going to yeah. just not argue over that and get jealous over that we're gonna move on not like oh that by the way that meant you have to you automatically pre-forgave me for every shitty thing that i did I'm like yeah i ran over your dog with a car but it happened when we were broken up <laughs> so uh you can't get mad at me for that like that's not right. how it works 
Yeah, no, I agree. I think that the agreement they made, she did not know everything that this was to include in Eric's mind, right? Right. Because I, I would think it was the standard, like, okay, you hooked up with someone, um, you, you know, maybe hung out with my ex, Cole, you know, like, we'll forgive all these kind of weird things that you did, we weren't together, but it's super messed up what he did. Mm -hmm. I feel like the argument was extra infuriating to me. Right. Because I do agree with him somewhat in that you can't go back and change anything. So I, I understand that it's like his perspective is like, okay, well, why are we going to harp on things that we can't change? But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you can dismiss her feelings and not acknowledge that it happened in the first place. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like that needs to happen first before you can move on. You can't just be like, okay, we're not going to talk about that. You said we would, you know, gloss right, over because, all that. Because it, it wasn't even like, I, I thought his line of, you know, argument was going to be like, you look through my phone. That's not cool. Why are you looking through my phone? Like mm -hmm. looking through my phone is a violation of trust, like and focusing on that part instead of focusing on nah, -uh, you said we didn't have to worry about this. You said I was yeah. free, like which is yeah, doesn't work. Well, he did kind of say, well, you looked, oh, uh, you know, you took my phone, like why? He said it like once at the very beginning. Yeah, but he didn't stay with that, right? No, he definitely didn't. And I just feel like everything that he like in the argument, everything that he said and did was. Just him, and I mean, this is not the first time we've seen it. It's incredibly frustrating being in an argument with a person who fights like this. It's kind of like the loudest voice wins. Yes. The person who doesn't let the other person talks wins, you know? And I felt mm -hmm. like that's how he was approaching this argument. He was not letting her talk. She was relatively calm. You could tell that she was just, like, upset, like, sad, you know, and she just wanted yeah. answers. Yeah. You know, she was just like, why? Why would you do that? It seems like you hate me. You know, she wasn't accusing him. him. You know, she wasn't coming at him like, you're an asshole. Why the fuck did you do that to me? You know, only a, a gross person, a disgusting human being. She never did anything. She was just like, yeah, why? She was like, do you even like me? Because it doesn't seem like you liked me when you did this. And then he yelled and they got, but oh, what disturbed me was the way both mm. of them, both of them just so casually and so like discreetly were closing all the windows oh, while they sure. were fighting. Yeah. Like this is not, you know, they have experience when they're just like, as we're fighting and screaming, let's just make sure all these windows close are closed. Close the windows, close yep. the curtains. <laughs> well, I mean, Larissa specifically, like right. she's already lived through this with Colt. She's had the police come over because of their explosive arguments. Mm -hmm. And so Larissa doesn't want to give anyone any kind of reason but rouse then, any kind of suspicion. And so I understand from her. Point. But then she does when she takes his phone. Yeah. Like, yes, I know you believe it's your phone, but like, what do, you, what do you care about more? The phone or staying in the U.S.? Because just leave the goddamn phone. Take that L, leave the phone, and not scream at the roommate who is who is really like, listen, dude, she's, he's trying to get you deported. Just give him the fucking phone back. Like, Right. <laughs> and she's yelling at him, why are you on his side? Like, when David called, I was like, he's actually trying to be cool and trying to, like, get her, give her an out of this. Because I think if it was Eric, he would just... I, I really feel like David was like, why don't you call her first, man? Well, here's my phone. Why don't you call her first? Don't like just call the cops on her. Right. I don't know. I just feel like it it was petty on her side. But I mean, it's hard for me to really side with Eric and David oh, no, no. on this. They're, I'm saying Eric is wrong. But the problem is it, it's it's like it's like if, you know, there's a crosswalk, right? If I step out in the crosswalk and, and the car doesn't stop, they're wrong. They were the ones mm -hmm. who were wrong. They're bad. But who pays the price? Right? So you got – from her, it's like, yes, you – they are wrong. It, it's your phone and it's a petty thing and they shouldn't get deported over it. But you might. And you have to recognize where you stand. 
Yeah, I don't know. I just, oh God, Eric is just so disgusting to me. Like when you were talking about just how he was talking with her and moving his hands every two seconds and the way he was talking to her, like yelling at her like she was a child. It was Mm -hmm. just disgusting to me. Well, I think it even looked worse when he did the interview where he was moving his hands, right? He had the thing and he was like, when we And he's like, focus, focus, as he's like, keeps on pointing to his eyes. And and he's like moving his hands back. But that, that to me, like made him look a whole lot worse because now he's talking to me like I'm a child. Yeah. Right. I mean, he the way he explained it is the way you explain something to a five year old. Well, what I really want to adults in the relationship when we talk about the nobody can see this is really missing out that you can't see the video because both of <laughs> us are wildly moving our hands while we do this. Right. But it was like I was like, why are you talking to me like I'm an idiot, Eric? Like I I see what's going on. And somehow he thinks that talking to her like a child is talking like an adult. Because one thing he says is that he's like, I thought that we would be able to talk about this like adults, like implying that she's not the one talking to him like an adult. And it's like, no, I'm pretty sure she is the one talking to you like an adult. Yeah. Then he wants to have circle time and that's adult talk. (laughs) Right. And that you're the one who's bringing up like insults, like the Dolly Parton thing. Yeah. And deflecting and yelling and being defensive. And he's the one saying that she's not acting like an adult. Right. All right, dude. And then after all of this, the topper, the part that I'm just like, okay, you've lost me forever. He wants an apology for her bringing this up, for her getting upset over this. Dream on, asshole. You deserve zero (laughs) apologies. And it wasn't even an apology for going through my phone. Like, that is the one wrong thing that she did. And he was like, no, she should apologize for bringing this. She should apologize for even thinking about the past. She should apologize to me. For calling Natalie, for, you know, digging this up. Yeah. God, I hate that guy. All right. right. Moving on to the other guy that is not my favorite. And and you know what? The guy was not the most objective. Well, we're going to talk about that. All right. So Colt, Debbie, and Jess are all getting ready to go to Sao Paulo which Jess considers her hometown and where most of her friends are. But first, they go to see Jess's family one more time to get their hospitality gifts. While everyone is hugging and sharing gifts, Colt pulls Jess's dad, Silvio, aside and uses some sort of weird visual translator app to ask for Jess's hand, which Silvio gives because he doesn't know Colt well enough and says he's a good guy. All right. Colt says it doesn't mean he's ready to propose right away, just that he's not sure when he'll get the opportunity in the short or medium term to ask in person ever again. In the car, Jess is lamenting how she doesn't know when she'll get to see her family again. Debbie is conf- Debbie is confused because she should be seeing her family in six months when her visa expires, right? <laughs> so now she's even more suspicious of Jess's intentions. She's also worried about the talk Colt was having with Silvio, and so she asks about it. Colt terribly lies that they were talking about football and guy stuff. And Debbie sees right through it, but lets the subject drop for now. In Sao Paulo, they check into their different hotel rooms on different floors. And then Debbie calls Vanessa to check on the cats. Of course, they also talk about the suspicions and Larissa-like behavior that Debbie is sensing from Jess. And Vanessa, of course, agrees with Debbie because she's only heard Debbie's side of the story. Debbie tells us that she plans to do whatever it takes to sabotage Colt and Jess's relationship. Soon, Colt and Jess come to Debbie's room to invite her to come with them to hang with the friends, and she hesitates like an entire two seconds before not so casually mentioning that she talked to Vanessa about the cats. Now, if you don't remember, Colt has been lying to Jess and says he no longer speaks to Vanessa. So Jess starts to get very mad. Colt being Colt doesn't like have a change in facial expression at all and eventually says something like looks like we have some trust here issues here guys as if debbie was in the relationship with them (laughs) and then debbie keeps more or less telling jess that if she doesn't trust colt they need to break up because you can't be somebody don't trust so you have to break up if you don't trust them in an interview debbie with debbie production asked if she knew vanessa would be an issue when she brought it up and her response is just a stupid shit-eating grin when they ask Jess what she thinks, she tells us she thinks Colt's a liar and Vanessa is actually his friend with benefits. Jess storms out of the room and Colt hopefully, helpfully adds, uh, 
Maybe I'll just stay here as Jess stomps to the elevator. <laughs> All right. So common theme here, you know, lots of flaws to people's thinking and actions. So everybody here is wrong at some, yes. some level. Yes. Okay. So rank them one, two, three from most objectionable to least objectionable of these three. Uh, Colt's number one. Okay. Uh, Debbie, number two, Jess, number three. Okay. All right. Okay. This is why I feel like Colt is never going to change. He did shit like this with Larissa all the time. He yes. is such a gaslighter. As soon as Jess says that she doesn't trust him, he's like, wait, we don't have trust in this relationship. Well, that's a problem. You know, and trying to make it seem like it's her issue. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, how, how, what, what? well, how? you know, if you don't have trust, how can we move on? Dude, she doesn't have trust because you lied to her. She had just <laughs> caught you lying to her two seconds ago. Because yes. he does that. He does that gaslighting. You're right. And, and that's people, I think, tend to overuse that term. But I feel like no, it applies, applies right here. Because yeah. she was like, she was, she just was like, oh, you've been talking to Vanessa? And he's like, of course I have. You knew that. You know, I've been talking to Betty. This is not a new thing. She's my friend. And he was like, she was like, no, you literally told me you were not talking to her. Yeah. And you lied to me. And oh, he's like, oh, well, that's because I didn't want, I didn't want there to be problems with us because I know you don't like her. Okay. Well, now I don't trust you. Right. Well, if you don't trust me, then there's a problem. How can we have a relationship that isn't based in trust? And it's like, he's making her seem like the crazy one. Yeah. You know, she's just like, wait a second. Like, so now it's on me that I don't trust you? No, dude, you're the one who made it so she doesn't trust you. So, yeah, that I, he is up to his old tricks. He is mm -hmm. lying and trying to make it seem like it's the other person's issue when they don't trust. It's like, well, they have a good reason not to trust you because you're very untrustworthy. Right. So that is why Colt is my number one. All right. So I thought Debbie was worse. Just right. because. But I was going to say, Debbie... The apple does not fall far from the tree. Let's just put it that no. way. No, he learned it from he learned it from an expert. Let's put it that way. Oh yeah, for sure. But the reason why I had Debbie as number two is because Debbie has no loyalty to Jess. Debbie is not in a relationship to Jess. Debbie wants Colt to not be in a relationship now, whether to say that means alter herself or not, whatever. She is. She's trying to sabotage this relationship. And so this is what you do when you sabotage a relationship. So to me, it's kind of like, eh, she's not breaking anyone's trust because she's just, you know, causing drama over here. It's like intentional, you know, like she doesn't have any loyalty to Jess. No, but she has, but she has loyalty to Colt. And that's what I don't get. Well, she's playing on his side too, right? Like, oh yeah, that's what, and that's part was what's so infuriating about it is. Oh her, yeah, is her. She was the one who like, said, "You need to trust my son." And not even you need to trust my son. The thing that made me the most angry about her is, and that's that. It has to do with her and Colt, and not just coming forward to Colt and being like, "You should break up with Jess. I don't like mm -hmm. this." Blah blah blah, and not saying it like that, but doing that and being like, "Oh no, oh, I accidentally told her," and then and then. Lying to Colt and being like, well, she's my friend too. Um, yes. That's why she's doing the cats and like playing, just play, trying to play like she's on his side. Yep. When yep. she was, she was not on his side. She's lying to him as bad as he's lying to Jess. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, but I'm, Jess is the thing with, I'm not, is the, we, we've already been on, she, like I said, she was mostly the victim here, but you know, I'm just not a fan of the, you're not allowed to talk to her anymore. Right. Kind yeah. of ultimatums, which is where, where this, why this whole thing is here. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like the other reason why Colt bothers me more than Debbie is I don't think that Debbie really tries to hide who she is. You know? Like, I know Larissa says, oh, she's like a wolf, you know? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, she could have very easily lied to production when they asked if she knew that Jess had a problem with Vanessa, you know? Sure. But I feel like Colt, Colt actually tries to make it look like he's the good guy. I think she does. Yeah. I, I mean, yes and no. I think she, I think she always tries to make it look like to Colt. She's the good guy. She makes it look like to Vanessa. She's the good guy. I'm just never okay with anybody who 
is just I'm going to sabotage that relationship. Like that is not your business. No. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, so it's kind of staying in your lane that bothers me too. It's like no, mm -hmm. that that relationship is not your business. We just sabotage someone else's relationship. Get help. Right. Okay, so that covers Happily Ever After. Yep. So there was a lot going on with them. All so right, much. so let's jump into uh, the other way. So let's start off with Tim and Melissa. Uh, Tim is excited for Melissa's cooking, and she makes some chorizo for breakfast. Tim is concerned because he sees that Melissa is guarded, but he has hope that they can figure it out. Melissa tells him over breakfast that they have a dinner with her parents. She also breaks it to Tim that her mom knows about the cheating and she does not approve of Tim. Tim starts crying because he doesn't want Melissa's dad to see him differently because he felt really close to her dad, regardless of the language barrier. Tim says that he wants to earn her again through his journey of redemption. And Melissa just kind of hollowly says, okay, because she's heard all of this before. Melissa thinks it's not hopeful for Tim to win over her mom, but she still thinks it's worth giving it a try. Tim is terrified of seeing her mom face to face. He greets everyone, including the dog, first <laughs> before he gives her mom a huge hug. She, uh, Martina says of course she gives him a hug because her heart isn't made of stone. Martina then asks why Tim is so fat. He just laughs it off saying he doesn't have time to exercise and Melissa's mom says, well, he needs to make time. Uh, Melissa's dad, Eduardo, then asks why they are living here if the original plan was to move to the U.S. They evade his question and then Melissa says that she just wants to change the subject. Eduardo excuses himself to get some tequila, which le leaves Tim alone with Melissa and Martina and he takes that chance to apologize. Melissa's mom says Tim is full of excuses and just because he's crying doesn't mean he's changed so we got a lot of tim crying so yeah. i also sense that melissa and martina they just they're numb to that it like gives them absolutely no reaction yep so they kind of say like they're not affected by this crying and it really kind of seems like they don't believe that he's really changed. Do you think Tim's really changed? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, I, I it just seems like he, they don't, I don't know. The thing that struck me, it doesn't seem like she cares for him. She cares for him that much, like cares for him in like the sense that, you know, Melissa, this is now, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't want, you know, I don't wish ill upon him, right? And I hope he has a happy life. But mm -hmm. she doesn't seem to like being around him. Like, and so it's like, I don't know how he can build a relationship on that. Because I don't know, I don't know what she thinks changed looks like. Right? right. What is she looking for? Because she yeah. is saying all these things and she's like, I'll believe it when I see it. And it's like, what? But how can you see that? The only thing you can see is the opposite if you were to cheat again. Right. But what is, you know, waiting? That's just time, right? It's so just time. Right. Ten years goes by and he hasn't cheated on you. So then you say he's changed. But then if he has a slip up like the next day after ten years, it's like all of a sudden, he's well, never, was he, he really changed? He didn't change? Changed? I don't know. And so that's where I think it's so confusing i feel like she has a sense of obligation and that's that she's doing this entire thing out of obligation rather than like an actual true desire to be with the guy but obligation of what like why did, they're not like engaged or anything like that no but i feel like it's a bit like your um which i don't know which podcast we talked about it last year with your give me my five years back like she he's oh, already right. spent five years on this like she doesn't want him to she doesn't want to just hit to throw away his five years or her five years like as i think we kind of what the obligation is but i think like if that's the case then she probably has some hope that there is some way of salvaging this and maybe that's what she's just trying to do she's i because honestly this is a different situation than we usually see in this 90 day franchise right is these couples um some of them are not engaged Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is a couple that is not engaged and we may not ever see them get engaged. And I think from her perspective, she's trying to see if she even 
wants to be with him. And so she just like to her, it's not like she's committed, like him moving down doesn't mean they have to get married. Right. Right. So what's it to her to be like, yeah, sure. Come down. I'll see if I feel any differently towards you. I'll see if, you know, I can maybe get past this. Maybe let's, you know, how long is a visitor visa? Like three months. Be here for three months. Uh, we can see if, I, you know, it changes anything, us being physically together. And I mean, like, wh what harm is there in that? It's almost like, uh, to her, there's nothing to lose. She might as well just try right. it. Right. But I totally see where she's coming from with his, like, apologies. Almost like now, at this point, she's heard so many apologies so much right. that they've lost all meaning. And it almost seems like the more he says he's sorry, the less sorry it seems like he really is. Yeah, she definitely seemed very, like, I don't know, apathetic to his apology at the breakfast at the very beginning of the show. Right. She was just kind of like, okay. Yeah, it was just very hollow. Yeah, it was so, like, uh-huh. Yeah, it's like when my kids talk about sure. something I'm not interested in. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Moving on. Uh-huh. So, and, and I think it is that counterintuitive thing. I think what she kind of wants to see him do, maybe, is actually move past it and not – Yes. And not just be yeah. obsessed with it all the time. If you're obsessed with it all the time, then I don't think you've changed because this one thing that you did, and we believe him, it was one time, like – you're still on it. Like you're still doing it over and over and over again. Every time you just dwell on it and circle around this drain, like you have, we have to, if you want her to move on, you have to move on too. Oh, yes. And I think the other thing is like, no one wants to be around a sad sack all the time. No. You know, like who's the guy that she fell in love with? She fell in love with kind of the fun, goofy Tim that had this positive outlook in life. And now she's stuck with this guy who's crying and apologizing every 10 minutes. It's like, you know, maybe this isn't the guy that, like, I really fell in love with. And maybe, you know, it doesn't seem to be changing at all. Right. Maybe we can't get that guy back. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the guy who she made him, like, a breakfast. I was like, oh, my goodness, I haven't had chorizo. You live in Texas, man. Get some chorizo know, right? if you want chorizo. <laughs> I haven't had Teresa in forever. Oh, two years. I'm like, what are you doing, man? I can't replicate her cooking. It's, <laughs> yeah. It does. It just seems like so brown nosy, too, the way he is. It's like he's just constantly, like, just over oh, the, the top. Oh, the baby. Yeah. And it, it, like I said, it makes it, it makes it lose all of its meaning when you're just like all right. the time, all the time, all the time. Well, like, the other part to that, too, is like psychologically, someone who is too available is like just less attractive, right? Mm -hmm. So for her, she's like seeing, oh, this guy is just all over me. He's just all up in my business. He is all about me. He's telling me how I'm the most perfect person. You're right, it does lose its meaning, but also you're just kind of like, eh, about this guy, you know? You're just like, well. Yeah, what's interesting, what's interesting about him now? Like, yeah, you know. Okay. There's no mystery there. Yeah, it's not even like, it doesn't even have to be like a mystery. It's like, is there anything going on there? Like, behind your face because all you're doing is apologizing to me and telling me how great i am that's not it doesn't make him look strong independent uh -uh. or like a person with his own interests right his own interests are her right right i mean that just it, it i can see that it's like okay dogs are great right mm -hmm. dogs are great and great companions but, but it's hard to live with just a dog who just has no no thoughts of her just like yes yes uh-huh yeah yeah uh -huh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah like like, I want to have a conversation with somebody who's, you know, got something going on there. Right. All right. So moving on, let's go to Jenny and Smith. So now that he has heard from, now that she's heard from Smith's lawyer, Jenny has a new biggest concern, Smith's family. So they're going to have dinner with Smith's brother, Amit, who seems to be the go-between and between Smith and his parents. After some painfully awkward small talk regarding the relative weights of different glasses, they finally get to the point. Amit has talked to Samit's parents, but they still don't approve of the relationship. The problem is primarily the age difference, and they feel that this marriage would not only hurt Samit, but it would cost the parents and the entire family to lose status in society. Jess wonders out loud why everyone is worried about what society will think and isn't worried about Samit's happiness. But Samit kind of interrupts her and explains that what his parents are trying to do is make the most people happy. Amit, clearly tired of being the runner in this situation, just wants the whole affair to come to a close. 
and suggests that they both meet with their parent with his parents. Simit protests a bit and tells us he's afraid that the that the only way the potential conversation with his parents will end is with his parents issuing an ultimatum, which he is not at all prepared to deal with. Amit is just tired and says this is the only way. All right, so it was just one scene, really short with them. Yeah. So do you really – do you think Jenny understands the pressures that, like, are coming with this for Samit and his family? I think she gets it. I just don't know she really – cares and I don't think she really gets that these are big issues because I thought it was really interesting how she was just kind of like well I'm here to stay and it's like are you? Are you? That's kind of what we're talking about right now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, you can't just decide, no, I'm going to stay here. It's like, mm, you're in another country. If someone doesn't sponsor your visa, you're in trouble. You're going to have to leave. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I guess the part that really struck, that really, you know, stuck out to me was she was like, why is everybody... She kind of has an American idea of like, well, what will society say? And she's like, who gives a shit what everybody else thinks? We're in love, right? And his family is yeah. like, um, yeah, the people who have jobs, uh, the people who are going to give licenses to things, the people – these people are society and they care and they're not – like maybe Sumit's sister might not be able to get a job because Sumit's married this old American and now his family is trash. Like there's a yeah. lot – the people the people were potentially would marry, all these people, it has consequences – it seems like it has consequences of greater and actually tangible consequences that maybe don't happen in America. Right. And I really feel like the solution to their problem is they just need to run away to another country and just right. get married. I'm not saying that other country needs to be in America because it definitely seems that Jenny is not in a financial place to do that. Mm -hmm. But there's got to be another Asian country that they can move to where they could live somewhat cheaply. Because I think the problem is not necessarily that he's getting married, but it's that he's getting married to her and she's like, out and about and, like, in the public with him, right? Right. It would be so much easier for them if, like, let's even say he moved to America and, like, got... You know, they could lie about, like, their son. Like, oh, he moved to America. They don't even have to really... I wouldn't even say lie. Like, even say anything about yeah, what he's it, doing It could be there. a lie. Yeah, it would not be a lie to say, oh, he moved to America. Right, because <laughs> he did. He moved to America. You don't need... You know, to embellish or anything like that. You could even say he got married to a woman. No one's checking up on them. Yeah, but it's not. It's not like he's they're going to see him. Like, well, I was going to the store and I saw your son with the weird old lady. What's going yeah. on with that? Yeah, right. They seemed very mm -hmm. close. Like, what yeah. was going on? Like, they wouldn't have to worry about anyone running into anyone. Like, the world is pretty big when you want it to be. Right. So it's like I don't understand why you are insisting on staying in the same area. And I know that the brother was kind of talking about, um, you know, it's cultural and a traditional thing for the oldest son, which would be Summit, mm -hmm. uh, to take care of his parents. So maybe that's why he w doesn't want to leave the country. But it's kind of at this point, if no one's going to approve of it, it's almost like, well, brother, you're going to step up. You are now the oldest. Right, right. I felt so bad for Amit, like the whole time. Mm -hmm. I was just like, this dude does not want to be in this situation. Oh, he doesn't like, want to be in He is in a lose-lose situation. He's caught between his brother and his parents. And Jenny's been like, don't you want your brother to be happy? He's just like, I just want this to stop. I just want it to go away. <laughs> it's like, what about me? I just want to be happy. I just want to live my life. And I'm worried about going between my parents and my brother and driving to the crappy part of town. And like, ugh. Oh, God. I know. I just feel like there's so many other places that they could live. You'd think there would be. I don't know how hard it is to get visas anywhere. But and, yeah. okay, and I was going to say, and let's even talk about India. India is a pretty big country. Yeah. Well, it's big enough for you to move to another part of India where, once again, like, your parents wouldn't see you. Right. I mean, it's not like – and let's be, let's be frank. He lives in Delhi. It's not like he lives mm -hmm. in some weird small town that there's nobody uh, – like you're going to be running into people all Everybody's the time. Everybody's gossiping a, about yeah, them. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's a freaking gigantic metropolis. Like, Right, right. But if they do things like, you know, their version of church and, you know, social sure. – like I don't know if they have a, a equivalent to the country he club totally, or something. He could totally disappear in the city and not run yeah. into any of his parents' people ever again. Like mm – -hmm. Doesn't even have to go to a different part of India if he doesn't want to. 
Maybe, maybe. All right, so let's talk about Devin and Jihoon. We pick up where we left off from last week where Jihoon has stormed off. Jihoon's mom is trying to calm uh, Devin down, but of course Devin can't understand Korean, and so she just then excuses herself. Jihoon's mom is blaming Devin, saying that Devin keeps bringing up the past, but Jihoon's dad actually takes Devin's side and says that she's lost her faith in him and it's kind of his fault. Jihoon's mom adamantly defends Jihoon, saying that they need to focus on the future, not the past. Jihoon and Devin end up talking outside without the translator app, so things start improving this week. Mm -hmm. So Devin asks why he spent his money on himself when she begged him to help when she was pregnant. He admits that he didn't take her very seriously because she was long distance. This immediately upsets Devin as she says that she never wants to talk to him again. Devin doesn't think he really loved her and wonders how he could take a pregnancy, couldn't take a pregnancy seriously. Devin says that she's been scammed, but Jihoon insists that he's been changing and she just doesn't see it. He tells her that once Taeyong was born, it changed everything. Devin wants him to prove that he has money and he's not lying and he uh, wants her to... She wants him to give her the $3,000. So Jihoon has to go back to the restaurant, ask his mom to give him cash now. She's somewhat resistant, but Jihoon says it's the only way Devin will stay. Jihoon's mom keeps laughing as they walk to the ATM because she feels that this is kids' play, but she questions how serious Devin is and if she'll ever trust him again. Uh, he, De uh, Jihoon hands Devin the money and tells her he's sorry. Devin just sobs because she feels like everyone's life is ruined. The next morning, Jihoon comes over uh, to the hotel that they're staying at, and Alicia is mad at Jihoon, so she has left the room to give them space. Jihoon says the night was emotional, but he wants to be forgiven and for her to trust him one last time. Devin doesn't care about what he says. She cares about what he does. Devin says she was hurt by him saying he didn't take her seriously, and Jihoon says that he just said things because he was upset. Devin insists that that can never happen again. She then says they need to have a joint bank account where all his money should go directly there and his parents should not have access to it. He agrees and tells us that his money is her money. She gives him a month to earn money so they can get a new place and says that in one month, if things haven't changed, she's going to go back to America. Devin says she's giving him another chance because of their son. Jihoon understands why the trust isn't there, but he is sad nonetheless. Okay, let's be real here. I feel like this has now happened two times. Him saying things are going to be different. Uh-huh. And, and then they're, they're, they're not, not different. different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you think that it's going to be different this time? No, Lucy is still going to pick up that football. Like, <laughs> I don't see how it's going to be different. Like, I just don't... It, I don't know. You like to think that people can change, but she was like, especially when she was like, she found out something yesterday and then today was like, well, you haven't shown me you've changed. And it was like, yeah, because it's been like 12 hours. Right, like that's why, right. like, what do you want me to show you in 12 hours? I don't understand how yeah. this is supposed to work. But when I watch these, I just can't, what struck me this time is how young Devin is. I oh, forget yeah. how young she is. And she a lot is, of the times she's like 23 and a lot of the time she does stuff. And I was like, that seems a little overdramatic. Why is she doing it like mm -hmm. that? I was like, oh, she's barely not a teenager. Sure. She's 23. Yeah. And so I forget about that because of the two kids. Right. Right. And she definitely seems like the mature, more responsible one out of the two because right. he's 31. Yeah. Yeah. I just because that. I don't know. The one that gets me because maybe this is just me. She says, I never want to talk to you again. God, yeah. And, and then turns around and is talking to him. And then turns around and is like, like, yeah, that that just like, <laughs> blows my mind. If a woman ever said to me, I never want to talk to you again, do you know what I would do? I would never talk never to her talk again. Never talk to her again? <laughs> You're like, that's what you wanted. Like, I, wait, wait, I could have just talked to her again and that would have worked? What the hell? Like, <laughs> Right, right. Um, I just, I feel that he is under her watch now that they're in the same country. So they have a better chance at it. Whereas I do think there really was something to the distance. Sure. Um, he was hanging out without her, drinking with his friends. He spent money on, you know, going out. 
So it's one of those things where she would have 100% noticed if they were living together that he was spending his money that way. Sure. So I think in a weird way that it will be easier for him to follow through, but it's definitely not because he's changed. It's because there's more oversight. Right. No, I see that because it's like, you know, even I, I really think his biggest issue is he's a procrastinator, right? He just puts right. it off and puts it off and puts it off. I'll get, I'll do yeah. that. I'll do that in a little bit. I'll do that in a little bit. That's what I he says like to her. I feel like lack of motivation on his own part too is right. part of it. And so that's a little bit tougher too when it's like, what jobs did you interview for today? What jobs did you apply for today? Did you get any resumes out? Like then when there's like, right. what did you do today at the end of every day? That's a little harder to keep doing what you're doing. But that has a pretty short shelf life. Like – yeah. Being – having oversight from your wife is not something that, that people are usually happy to go with for a long period of time and they start to resent it. Uh, I think it might be a little different. I think that it is very much part of Asian culture to be more compliant about things mm -hmm. and so they tend to be like – raised culturally to be less combative that doesn't mean to say that they're not but i think if we think about you know americans yeah that would not fly in this country most people would not be okay with someone nagging them because they would see it as nagging right right and being right. told what to do you can't tell me what to do mm -hmm. that's like just not a thing here right like that is something that, you know, if your partner was telling you what to, heaven forbid they ever tell you what to do. Right. You should, I need you to apply to this job and this job and this job. And then I no, want you to come. No, that's not like, going to happen. Right. Right. Um, I also feel like Jihoon's mom is definitely an enabler. I mean, yeah. we've seen it, right? And I feel like she makes excuses and excuses his behavior. And I feel like that's part of the reason why it's hard for him to be motivated because it sounds like mommy just bails him out every single time. Right. And not only bails him out, tells him he was right. Right. I mean, thank God his dad yeah. was like, no, like Devin has yeah, a Yeah, except good when right he said that, what, what did the mom end up doing? She said, you shut up and get off the camera. Yep. Go. I need to <laughs> I need express to my saying. feelings. Yeah. You are wrong. <laughs> You go, you go in. He just, he just did. He, you're right. He just did. Compliant dad yeah. just went. Yeah. So I kind of feel like, yes, Jihoon may be resentful right. that he's being told what to do and bossed around. I'm not saying that. I mean, that's maybe like a natural human reaction, sure. right? But I also feel like he will go along with it because as much as he may be resentful that someone else is telling him what to do. I hope that he's mature enough to realize it's for their own good, not even his own good, but for the family. Right. But on the flip side of that, maybe not short term, maybe not medium term, but long term, mm -hmm. if she has to keep doing this, she's going to get resentful for having oh, to plan. Oh, they're both going to be exhausted. For having to plan like four people, like, two kids and her and her, but she's planning four people's lives at the same time. Right. Like, right. you know, if he could never figure out what job he has to get or what, where he should spend his money and she's doing all of it, like she's going to end yeah. up being the resentful one. Oh, for sure. Cause yeah, like I said, it, it's exhausting to have to be on someone all the time. I mean, we know we're teachers, right? To have right. to be on the student who isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's exhausting. Right. And it takes up all my work. Like, I, I can't do anything else because I can't have to keep – I mean, even if it's just, like, small pushes, I'm not even doing anything. Put your phone away and get right. back to work. Put your phone away and get back to work. Okay, put your phone away and get back to work. <laughs> Sometimes the class is when it's like that. It makes me feel like a glorified babysitter. Mm -hmm. And it's like I, I don't feel like that's my job. But at the same time, I can't do my job unless you are – in a certain motivated space. And so right. that means I have to motivate you. You know, but it's just, it's just exhausting. Uh, yes. All right. Um, so speaking of also exhausting is Ariel yeah. and Binyam. So Binyam, Ariel, and Janice are going to dinner with Binyam's brothers and sisters. Brother and sisters. One brother, two sisters. Janice wants to get to know the family that she'll be putting her baby into the hands of and really grills them for reassurance that Ariella will be okay. They get food served uh, that really puts Janice off because it's mostly just raw meat mixed with butter. 
The family shows her the Ethiopian tradition of Gersha, where they feed each other food, and Ariella tells Binyam's sister, who feeds Janice, that she is lucky because her mom would have punched anybody else that tried to do that. Aww. <laughs> As they eat, we start to hear how nervous Binyam's family is about Ari as well, because the way Binyam's previous relationship with an American ended. Ariella feels like she's paying the price for what his ex did, and the family wants reassurance that Ariella will not just run off with the baby. They worry about how things will go when Ariella leaves the country with the baby, although Binyam says he would not stop her. In the second, much more fun scene, Ariella and Janice go to the strip... No, I'm sorry, not the strip club, just the regular club, but we were pretty <laughs> close to see to see Binyam's dancing in action. Uh Alien, the, the Americans seem really out of place as they complain about how loud the music is. But, and Janice says there's a lot riding on how she judges Binyam at his job. As Binyam and his partner start dancing, Ariella tells us and her mother that the partner is actually one of his exes, which gets slightly awkward as the dance gets more and more racy, ending with the partner doing the splits upside down and Binyam playing her ass like bongo drums. <laughs> so weird it was interesting janice tells us that Vinny and his ex make a good match and Ari ariella tells us that she tells us that she's worried about the situation because she is a jealous person and that anyone who says they're not jealous is lying after the dance Binyam comes to talk to them and janice starts to grill him about why he's no longer with the partner he says that he was younger and didn't pay enough attention to her but he's better now and sometimes his job can get in the way and cause some jealousy issues with his girlfriend. He tells a long convoluted story about lipstick getting on his shirt and both the ladies express their concern about his dishonesty when it comes to facing jealousy in the relationship. So that's where they end with you. So I'm going to ask you the question. I'm going to base my question based on Ariella's theory. Is everyone either jealous or lying? Um, I agree with her. I feel like jealousy is one of those like, uh, you know, emotions that you can't help but feel. Mm -hmm. But I would kind of also add to that. I think that we maybe don't think about it too much because some people have these jealous, like, fleeting thoughts. But we're a lot, and I shouldn't say we because I, I don't want to group myself into this, but some people are a lot better about controlling those thoughts and actions, right? Right. And so it's like the fleeting thought like, oh, that person, you know, is spending a lot of time with my partner, you know, maybe something could happen, right? Fleeting thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I trust my partner. Like, there's nothing for me to worry about. And so it would never kind of come out in any kind of form of action or talk or anything like that so that person probably wouldn't be considered jealous but that's right. not to say that they don't have these jealous thoughts so i think from that perspective yeah i think she's absolutely right right i mean i i guess i was like it's a little different because yes everybody experiences all emotions everyone has experienced jealousy everyone experiences anger everyone experiences sadness but not everybody is an angry or sad or jealous person like there's sure. a difference between those saying those two things. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't think everybody is a jealous person. I think everyone feels jealousy from time to time. And like you said, some are better, just like anger, just like sadness. Some people are better at dealing with that and, you know, going in a better positive direction. Other people are not. And so the people who are better at it aren't lying. It's not like they're. So I, 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 I reject the framing of lying, if that makes sense. Yes, but I think maybe not admitting or acknowledging that they have those thoughts at all. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I think that's what she's saying. Right. But I was kind of surprised to hear that she says that she is crazy jealous. Because doesn't it seem like she's just, she definitely has come off so far as kind of happy-go-lucky and it's like, I feel like there are moments where we're kind of realizing that that is not the case. Right. You know, like even when let's go back a couple episodes when she was looking at the apartment, you know, mm -hmm. like I was kind of surprised. She seemed like this kind of free loving hippie type who was just like, oh, whatever, you know, and all of a sudden like this place isn't good enough for her. Right. Right. She definitely seemed like someone who spent her who spent her fair share of time in hostels. And you'd think like right. but now this apartment is no good. What is this? Yeah. 
And kind of the same thing with, like, uh, you know, partners. I feel like she's kind of one of those people who are like, oh, people come in and out of your life and you just love who you love at the moment. Like, she seems like one of those types right. to me. But I think I think it might be the worst of both worlds. I feel like she might be like that for her, but not for you. Mm. Like, yeah, I'm jealous. I don't like this. You're dating your ex. You're talking to your ex. You're working with your ex. But also on the same on the same side, just being like, but this guy's just my friend. I don't understand what the problem is. Like, this is right. not an issue, right? So that that is what – those are the vibes I'm starting to get from her. Because – and the other thing, too, that came out, especially at the end, especially at the end when they were, when he was talking about, like, well, you know, the little white lies he told. Yeah. Her and her mom are a lot alike. Oh, God, yeah. Like, he said something about, like, oh, you know, they're like – they were like, would you do that in this relationship? He was like, well, I don't know. And they both made the same noise and the same facial expression <laughs> at the exact same time. That is funny. Um, but I thought uh, her mom was definitely trying to cause some drama. Yeah. Like saying that, oh, they have great chemistry. It's like, oh, yeah, the mom well, shouldn't it look her. that way? They're like dance partners, right? It would be bad if they didn't look like they had great chemistry. Right. It would. It would be awkward and bad. It would be stilted. It would be a bad dance. Like you're supposed yeah. to, you know, it's kind of like, um, I don't, it reminds me of when, you know, when they did, when, you know, Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga did a Star is Born. And everybody's like, oh, I think they're really into each other. And I was like, it's, like, it's yes, called actors. acting. <laughs> yeah, what are you talking <laughs> yeah. about, guys? <laughs> right. But then how many times have you, like, said that? I mean, people have said that. And then it's been true. Like, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, right? I guess so. But I don't, I don't know. I just feel like I feel like some people are fully capable of acting and, like, Dancing. Well, because the other thing, too, is I've definitely seen people like that and be like, wow, they seem really into each other. And it's like, he's gay. Like, so. Oh, sure. <laughs> I don't think that's it. No. Yeah. I mean, but you could have gay chemistry. Or sorry, not gay chemistry. Gay chemistry. <laughs> you can have great chemistry without it being like sexual chemistry, too, right? Or even romantic chemistry. Like, yeah, that, yes, yes, right. Romantic chemistry, sure. Well, I don't know that sexual chemistry and romantic chemistry are necessarily one-to-one -one corresponding, but... Sure, sure, they're, sure. They're in the But same I mean, part, right? yeah, you could have, like, good banter and things where it seems like you really get along. But I'm talking about things like, you know, else. dance, like, especially when you're talking about dancing or dance partners yeah. or ice skating, skaters and things like that. Like, wow, that looks oh, really sure. sensual. And you're like, yeah, but he is totally gay. Eh. This is not sensual at all. <laughs> I don't know if it was really sensual so much. I was just confused by it. It was really literal. Yes. Like he was playing her legs like she was a piano and her ass like it was a bongo drum. And I was like, what is this? Yeah. I mean, she was very flexible and limber. That was, I mean, I'm more, yeah. I was way more impressed with her, what she was doing than with what he was doing. I was confused by what this was in the first place because we definitely it is don't weird. have things like that it's not a strip club no but it's definitely like dancing entertainment right but it was a, some sort of club where the where the dancing was entertainment not a club where people are dancing yeah. just to grind on each other but like one right like you watch someone where you watch someone dance which the is the only kinds of shows i know of that kind are like strip clubs right. and drag shows true right i mean they do have the ones that are like burlesque which is just fancy strip club but Sure. Right. You know, but yeah, I'm trying to think of a situation where it's like a club, not a stage. Not like when you go see a stage show and people are dancing, but a club. Right. Where you just watch people dance. That's not something you. Yeah, it's not something you see. Most of the time. Dance I mean, clubs, I wouldn't be opposed to it if it was here. Yeah. I'm kind of bored by dancing, actually. On occasion. <laughs> on occasion. It's not something I'd be at every Friday or anything like that. Sure. Why does her mom want to be right in front? It's like they were complaining about the music being loud. It's like the front is the worst place. It didn't seem that big that that music would have been all that much quieter right. if they were in the back. To be fair to them, well, I don't know. It was that because that was the table they had reserved. I think it was a reserved table for them. Okay. The other thing is, why was Baby all excited to show off his dancing when it seemed kind of risque in some parts? I think in his head, he was like. Yes, I'm acknowledging to you that this dance is risque. I am, you know, playing her ass like bongo drums and her legs like a piano. And I think he started off like she kicked her leg in the air and he played it like a bass or something. Yeah. Whatever it was. But he was touching her a lot, right? Yes. And – um, but I think he was like, no, I'm doing this because I'm not trying to hide anything from you. I, if I know you're a jealous mm -hmm. person, this is just – I'm being straight up front. This is what I do. 
you see it all. I'm not, there's nothing, there's no secrets here. This is what it is. So let me just, let's show everything. It's not just you, but also your mom. Like there's no secrets here, but I don't know that that was my theory. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So that was it for them. And so we did not hear from Brittany and Yazan and uh, Kenny and Armando this week. That's correct. Yep. Yep. So what about your student of the week? Uh, I went with, I forgot her name, but Sinjin's mom. Um, she seemed to. So give it to the moms. Yeah, I know. Uh, it was I, Main cast was tough. Because, yeah, right. I mean, she really did seem to be going after the right thing you know we had a lot of parents who were trying to figure out what was going on right let me get to the bottom of what, what this is what, what it's like but she wasn't like let me get to the bottom of who tanya is or what she's how she's stealing my kids she was like i'm getting the impression that you're not happy i just want to know i want to get to the bottom of are you happy can you be happy and that so she was a, it was a positive concern rather than a negative you evil witch stole my son type of concern from some other moms mm -hmm. right <laughs> yeah well i definitely gave it to the moms this week for student of the week and dunce so uh the mom who got my student of the week was martina melissa's mom i just felt like she was cordial to tim like she said, my heart's not made of stone. I mean, she was very polite mm -hmm. when he first came in, gave him a warm, welcoming hug. At the end of the day, she's like mama bear, right? Sure. She's only mad at Tim because of how he hurt her daughter, right? And so I, I think that she was kind of like real talk with his apologies. Like, okay, these, these, this doesn't really sound like an apology. This sounds like an excuse. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're crying, not really changing anything. Oh, also kind of quick side note. I want to say something about Tim's uh, Spanish while okay. we didn't talk about it. I forgot to. Yeah. His Spanish is pretty good. It's pretty good. I, like, I, I had was noted impressed. that too. Like he had stopped and reverted to English and she even, and Lisa even told him, try to say it in Spanish. Yes. But in terms of like Americans learning oh, the foreign yes. language, he was really far up there in terms oh, of sure. the ones we Above yeah. most of, I give him an A. Yeah comparatively i mean we're definitely grading on a curve here right but yeah i would give him an a for his spanish speaking skills yeah. but yes martina is my student of the week all right so i i can assume you picked someone so okay <laughs> I would say, no i didn't i my class dunce is debbie okay um oh we really did pick the moms i know it's week, all about then. moms Go, um, yeah, all about yeah moms. I, I went with debbie just when we, we rehashed it but oh just the idea of it, you have this weird protective, weird ass protective relationship with your son. And I, and yeah. again, we always psychoanalyze that it's not really about protecting his son. There's something weird in there that she just wants him to herself, yeah. right? To the point where you're sabotaging his relationship because she did not have a, her wildest, we talked about this last time, her wild you know, theory about what Jess was after was a long-term happy relationship with Colt. Right, right. Like, I think she might be using him to have kids and a long married life together. Like, okay, Debbie, why, I must sabotage this. Like, right. Yeah. My kind of take on her whole deal is that she is just very dependent on Colt. And right. it's, she does want Colt to be happy and I think that she recognizes that any partner that comes in isn't going to like their close relationship and then their relationship is immediately under threat. I feel like Debbie would be okay if Colt somehow managed to find a girl who loved Debbie and would never even think about, you know, leaving Debbie out of their living situation about like just their dependency on one another. I, I I'm not sure she would. I don't think she would like that. I don't think she would let that stand. And like any kind of attention that he's paying to some other woman is attention he's not paying to her. I well, yeah. I don't know. That's just my theory on it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so my dunce is actually Ji Hoon's mom. Okay. So Ji Hoon's mom, total enabler. Uh, you kind of wonder why your son is like the way he is. It's because you're telling them that he's pretty much right all the time. And guess what? He is not right all the time. 
And I just kind of feel like she is not helping the situation by kind of laughing at it, saying this is kid stuff, Mm -hmm. like your wife is to blame for this, she needs to get over it. Right, and like talking to someone in Korean that you know doesn't speak any Korean, like what are you doing? Yeah, so sorry, Jihoon's mom. (laughs) All right. All right, so life lessons. Um, Yeah, I went to I, I something else I said earlier, but I like to stress, like, as Americans, we have to learn, you know, one of the worst things people hate about Americans is our assumption that our country is so much better than every other country that right. everyone wants Everybody's to come. Everybody's clamoring Everybody to get here. Everybody is just clamoring to get here. And it's, yeah. it's silly that to assume that everyone's end goal is America, specifically like Tampa. Like, it's so weird that from Tampa – and they're like, well, you're just <laughs> yeah. trying to get to Tampa, right? Who wouldn't want to be in Tampa? It's like, that's like a like fourth-rate American city. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, don't offend people from Tampa. Uh, that's true. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, yeah, all right. Was that it for your life lesson? That's it. Don't assume that everyone's end goal is getting to America, especially when Fair they're already enough. in a country that, like, has a comparable life, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah. Quality of life. Right. So my life lesson is inspired from Eric and Larissa. Just keep intimate things intimate. So no matter how far south things go in a relationship, it's like you're the one who's going to look like an ass out of it. Right. So and I think it's weird that it, there's a line, right? I kind mm-hmm. of feel like because I, I feel like Eric felt that she crossed the line when she said, oh, he doesn't really want to have sex that much. Right. Like. To me, that's, like, not intimate details. Right. That's just, like... But he was, like, you were talking about our sex life, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. And so, I guess everybody's line is going to be a little bit different. I'm with you. I don't sure. think that counts as crossing the line. You know? No. I don't know anything about Eric in bed by hearing that he didn't want to have sex with her. Giving the details of, yeah, the tech of technique, that's a different story. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is just too far, so... Okay, then. Uh, So that wraps up this episode. So I don't think we have anything else to add, do we? No, we don't. Okay, good. All right. Talk to everybody later. See you same time next week. Yep, same time next week. Okay, Okay, bye. bye.